Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and tonight is our last daily video on YouTube. Saying that, we will be doing them in the future, probably once a week, uh, maybe sometimes twice a week, but just so you know, as we said in last night's video, this is our last daily video. So what are we going to talk about for our last daily video? Well, as you can probably imagine, we're from Worcester and Worcester was heavily involved in the Civil War. Saying that, uh, the Civil War is just one aspect of the history of Worcester, but Worcester does play an important part in that Civil War. If you think about it, Worcester sees the first clash of arms of the entire Civil War fought on the 23rd of September 1642. And that was at a place called Powick Bridge, mainly fought between Royalist Cavalry under Prince Rupert and Parliament Cavalry under Nathaniel Fiennes. And it was a short engagement, but it set a precedent of what the Civil War was going to be like. After a short period of occupation by Parliament forces, Worcester was eventually uh, occupied by the Royalist forces. Forces, and it stayed royalist uh, for the first part or the first phase of the Civil War. Now what you must remember however is if you look at the citizens of the city they probably sided with Parliament. We've got a lot of evidence for that to be fair but the occupying army from the end of 1642 was royalist so most people would say Worcester was a royalist city. Anyway, um, in 1646, we have uh, the New Model Army on the field, as they were in 1645 at the Battle of Naseby, commanded by Oliver Cromwell and Sir Thomas Fairfax. And basically, they were uh, clearing the battlefields of Britain. In other words, 1645, you get the Battle of Naseby, the New Model Army. Uh, pretty much decimate the Royalist army. And then there's an interesting battle, semi-local to Worcestershire, and that's the Battle of Stow-on-the-Wold. And the Battle of Stow-on-the-Wold is fought in 1646. And at the end of it, we can pretty much say the Royalist field army, the only field army in existence for the Royalists, was pretty much wiped out. Now, after that battle, the majority of the survivors fled in every direction possible, but strangely, Worcester being the last garrison, the last city to hold out, saw a large proportion of them. So if you lived in Worcester in the summer of 1646, you would have suddenly seen a big influx of royalists, uh, a ragtag army as such really, many of them wounded, uh, many of them without weapons, in arms and they would have been fleeing into Worcester being the last royalist stronghold and we know they were a mixture of troops we know Worcester uh, in, from, from records of the time complained massively about the Irishman that was with this royal army that had come into Worcester and by all accounts they were drunkards they were smashing the place up uh, and being very violent to local people and that's why I always say Worcester is technically occupied by the royal army but was it really royalist probably not to be fair but Worcester saw a siege in this period as well and interestingly um, Worcester is besieged and it falls to Parliament forces in 1646. Most of the people in the city are actually quite glad that the city has now fallen because technically it is the end of the war. And without going into too much detail, what follows is very simply the capture of King Charles I, the execution of Charles I, and the end of the war and this now takes us up to 1649 and the interesting fact is the young prince prince charles fled to europe and whilst he's in europe in this period after the civil war um he decides to discuss especially with his uh confidences his uh advisors that uh, maybe the young prince should land back in Britain, march on London, is take his father's throne. After all, as he actually said at the time, uh, seek revenge for his father's murderers. Anyway, 
Charles did decide to land in Britain and he sailed across the sea and he decided to land in Scotland. The reason for Scotland is he was a Stuart King and just like Bonnie Prince Charlie later on, he thought that he would get full support of the Scots. Now the funny thing is, it's the Scots that actually handed Charles V, his father, over to Parliament soldiers. So really, it was a silly thing to do to land in Scotland. Now. He does fight a battle. In the year 1650, on the 3rd of September, Charles actually fights a battle in Scotland. Just outside Edinburgh is a small fishing village known as Dunbar. Myself and Helen visited it several years ago and it's a nice little place really. And Charles at the time was not this man with a little moustache and beard and long black flowing hair. That's the normal image of him that you see at the time of the Great Fire of London in the Samuel Pepys diary era, the restoration technically. So Charles at the time was a very young man. There he is there. He was only 21 years of age by the time we have the Battle of Worcester campaign. And Charles is very inexperienced. His only combat experience, other than seeing and sort of taking part in the Battle of Dunbar, was the fact that he had watched a battle, the Battle of Edge Hill, way back in 1642 when he was a child. But now at 21, his aim, landing in Scotland, was to retake his father's throne, the throne that uh, was taken from his father, Charles I, um, in, in horrific circumstances, basically, his father's execution, really. So Charles fights the Battle of Dunbar, and sadly, it is a complete disaster. And any normal person would think, well, Charles lands in Scotland, he fails at the first hurdle, he would probably go home. But interestingly, he doesn't. It's at that point he decides to plan to march on London. Now, Cromwell, in the meantime, the successful commander of the Parliament forces at the Battle of Dunbar, he is a veteran. He has the scars to prove it. He knows what he's doing. He's a great tactician. And you can tell he is uh, the great commander of forces, of his personal, is is perfectly well-trained and well-disciplined New Model Army. And he's in Scotland. Now, Charles decides to slip back into Britain and march straight down to London to march to the capital as he knows Cromwell and the Parliament Army are actually in Scotland so it'd be a perfect opportunity to walk straight into London so he thinks. Now the reason for this video is the fact that on the 31st of July 1651 so today is the anniversary of it Charles takes his small army out of Stirling with an aim to march on London. So, over 300 years ago, this man was bringing an army out of Stirling, heading down to London. Most people in Britain didn't know this. Even Oliver Cromwell didn't know it straight away. The only problem is there was major problems with this army. They hadn't really thought about supplies. They just thought, we'll march into England, we'll march all the way down to London and we'll pick up supplies on the way. But the sad thing is, and this is what you have to remember, at the time of 1651, this was classified as a Scottish invading army. Most people in Britain, most people in England, I should say, does not want this army marching through. And they will be very hostile to this man and his army of about 12,000 men. The other problem they had was there's a lot of infighting within the Royalist army. For example, Charles was not a brilliant commander, so he was looking for someone to command his troops on the ground. And interestingly, there was four people that he could have called upon. The first one was the Duke of Buckingham. Now, the Duke of Buckingham was the only true English commander in this Scottish army, shall we say, this invading Scottish army. And the problem was he was pretty young and a bit inexperienced as well. So Charles had to look at three other people. The other ones were the Duke of Hamilton, which is actually the one that he favours overall. There was a man called Leslie, who was a very good cavalry commander. And then there was another Scotsman called Middleton. And the problem is, those three Scottish people absolutely hated each other. So Charles has got this army of about 12,000 men, no proper tactical idea of what's happening. 
He's going to cross the border into England and he's going to march into London, hopefully slipping through the net of Cromwell and the Parliament New Model Army. Is he going to succeed? Well, I'm not going to spoil the story because what we're going to do is over the next few weeks up to the 3rd of September, we will cover the route, in fact, of the Royalist Army as they slip out of the, con con the, the area of Oliver Cromwell and down to what becomes the Battle of Worcester that is eventually fought on the 3rd of September 1651. So just to leave that with you, we've got a 21-year-old Charles, uh, a rebel prince you could call him, even though he was technically sort of given a, uh, a, a crowning ceremony in Scotland. Uh, Oliver Cromwell is in Scotland and he's the successor of the Battle of Dunbar and he's trying to control the Scots people up there. But this Royalist army are on their way south. They've left Stirling. That's today, 31st of July, 1651. And there's infighting. The army's not that big. There's not enough supplies. And they're assuming they will get resupplied on the way down through the local areas. But you have to remember, as soon as they cross that border, the whole of England is not going to want them there. They're seen as a Scottish invasion. So today, as I said, is the anniversary of the day Charles leaves Stirling on what becomes the Worcester campaign, culminating in the 3rd of September 1651. Anyway, on that note, stay safe, have a good weekend. Remember, you're not going to get a daily video now, but you will get them. Not as regular, but you might have one Monday, you may have one on Friday. But do keep a lookout. Make sure you subscribe and share our posts. We're going to put them on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram as always. And we like the interaction. If you want to discuss the faithful city further, if you want to discuss which is the best officer, the Duke of Buckingham, the Duke of Hamilton, uh, any of those, please do. We like debate. History is all about debate. Anyway, on that note, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.